So we're uh, carrying on reviewing Naming Adult Autism, Culture, Science and Identity by James McGrath. Yeah, so he also mentions, of course, it goes without saying on page 113, that autistics can and do internalise good stereotypes. Um, and this is a good case, you know, for all um, minority groups. Um, in general, I think, that they can internalise the stereotypes. You know, gay people internalise stereotypes about what it is to be gay, and so on and so forth. Ethnic groups internalise the stereotypes or what, what, you know, the, the stereotypes for their ethnic group and so on. Um, people, you do internalise the stereotypes as well. Um, it's kind of, sometimes it can be hard not to. Um, and that can be a kind of form of, like, internalised oppression. You know, like, we talk about internalised ableism, you know, there's internalised patriarchy and so on. Um, because if you're surrounded all the time by this oppressive narrative about what you are, who you're meant to be, it's very hard not to internalise those stereotypes, and that can have a very negative effect on self-esteem. But we also have the freedom and the agency um, to be, that can be... We do have the freedom and agency to continually question what culture says it means to be autistic. We don't have to accept it. We can answer back... Um, we can put forth our own views. We don't have to agree with what culture says it means to be autistic. Because we're the ones, I'm talking here when I say we, I'm talking, you know, I'm referring to other autistics. But we are the ones who are actually experiencing autism. We are the ones who are actually living it day to day. Um, so we are, in a sense, the experts on our own autism. Obviously, I can't speak for other autistic people because I can only speak for my own autism and what I experience. Other people have their own, uh, you know, um, experiences of autism. But all of our voices should be heard. You know, no one should have a monopoly because there's no... Um, e you know, no one should have a monopoly on what autism is because autism isn't one thing. It affects people in so many different ways. So we can question the stereotypes. We don't have to accept them. And that can be empowering when you realise that. Because it can be really harmful to your self-esteem and stuff. Um, you know, because taking all of those stereotypes, I know it's all too well. It can be very harmful to your self-esteem. But at the same time, we can practice kind of answering back to the stereotypes. And that can make us feel good about ourselves when we do that. Um, you know, you can educate people. You can tell them they're wrong, basically. You don't have to accept what they say because they're not, they're not walking in your shoes. Yeah. So I think that's something that's really important there that McGrath says. Um, and then he also, he, he also refers to some more positive, empowering autism stories. For example, for UK poet Joanne Lindbergh's The Autistic Alice, 2017. I haven't read it. I might read it at some point. Um, but um, James McGrath really likes um, The Autistic Alice. Um, this is Joanne Lindbergh's collection of poetry about being autistic. Um, and it's based on uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, where Alice is recast as autistic. So in this version, the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland is cast as the embodiment of a neurotypical adulthood, the personification of established authority. Um, and um, Alice is ridiculed for her slowness, um, her tardiness and her slowness. Um, in, in the way she walks and runs and dances. And this is the Red Queen tells her off for this. It's made out as though it's a problem. Um, but instead, the problem really is that Alice is continually compared with her peers. It's not that there's anything wrong with Alice for being slow, for um, you know not walking as fast as her peers, not running as fast as her peers, not keeping up with her dancing. It's, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. It's the problem here is the way that she's being compared with her peers because everything becomes comparative in this oppressive um, sort of world that she lives in. Um, and the Queen's focus is confined to the physical outward appearances. She has no interest in Alice's feelings whatsoever. Her only interest is that Alice is that how Alice compares to her peers, that Alice is not keeping up with her peers, that there's something different about Alice. That's the only thing that concerns the Queen in her very sort of narrow vision. Um, so it's similar here to um, Carol's original tales, which highlight the nonsense of so much that becomes elevated as normal, you know, because that was the whole point of um, the original Alice tales, you know, was um, holding a, uh, a ridiculing, a kind of parodying uh, 
lens up at society, kind of, you know, highlighting the flaws of conventional society and the absurdity of it, making me actually quite like to go and read Alice in Wonderland again, actually, because I haven't read it for tales for a long time. Um, but actually, McGrath suggests that it's a neurotypical, neurotypical in inverted commas, queen whose understanding of others is impaired, which is ironic. Um, and then he goes on to talk about the so-called new classic autism, and this is um, a phrase that McGrath has coined, the new classic autism. Because when we think about classic autism, what usually comes to mind is how autism used to be um, uh, represented, as it were, um, the sort of old image of what autism was, um, which, um, you know, was usually a child who, and it was usually a child, because obviously autistic people grow up to become adults, but the focus was usually on children. Um, it's your child, it's usually a boy, who uh, had minimal speech, sometimes no speech, um, was often uh, intellectually impaired, um, and displaying very obvious behaviours that you couldn't ignore. Um, that was kind of what came, that was what autism was considered to be in the early days when autism first came to people's awareness. So that's why it's called classic autism, you know, in referring to the fact that that was like the original kind of paradigm, as it were. But McGrath, um, with regards to the new classic autism, he actually says that the narrative has shifted now so much um, towards uh, elevating a representation of autistic people who are extremely able. Um, and often to the extent of having remarkable gifts. And um, and this is now the sort of representation that you increasingly see. So it shifted from the, from, a, from a focus on autistics with intellectual impairment, who couldn't speak, very obviously disabled, to autistics with like, who are like extremely able, like a complete opposite. And he says this has now become the new classic autism. And he actually says it's become rather repressive. He said it's become a repressive narrative feature of the early 21st century because of the notion, your non-autistic notions of high achievement. It's um, um, cultural standardisation and idealisation of high achievement. So that the idea is that you're only acceptable as an autistic person if you meet the cultural... Um, uh, the cultural sort of ideal um, of like high achievement um, but you have to fit into this very narrow kind of niche in order to be accepted as an autistic person despite the fact that ironically most autistics are not fulfillingly employed that is the reality most autistics are actually not in work most are actually on benefits um, and McGrath talks about the neoliberal, what he calls the neoliberal phase in autism narratives from the outside. Um, the neoliberal phase, and I think this is very interesting because I'd actually agree 100% with him. I do think there's a neoliberal agenda going on here. That basically autism is acceptable if it's good for business, basically. If autism is good for business, and this all comes down to the whole kind of like STEM agenda as well, like the emphasis now in, in um, modern developed societies is the emphasis on science, technology, engineering and maths. So if you're good in those areas, you're all great. If you're not good in those areas, you're not interested so much in those areas, you're more into the arts and humanities, we've got a problem because that is, I mean, <laughs> what I mean is that that's, those areas have now become increasingly denigrated because they're seen as not being fit for our economy because everything comes down to quantity, not quality. That will take a whole other video. Um, but yeah, so basically because of this um, Simon Baron Cohen emphasis on autistics all being good at STEM subjects, which of course is a load of crap, because I mentioned in my other video, um, if um, there's become this kind of like cultural kind of almost glorification of autism as meeting this economic requirement. Um, and this is coming from the outside, but it's most disrespectful of all to individuals who are classic in the old sense who do, you know, there are many of these autistics around, but they hardly seem to, you hardly seem to get any representation these days, it seems. Um, in the original sense, of facing extreme impairments in what society deems as the norms of intelligence and language. It's almost like they've vanished off the scene, maybe, you know, because they're not, maybe because, you know, they're just not economically lucrative, um, which is absolutely appalling, you know. It shouldn't come down to that. It should come down to the fact these are real people with lives, with stories, and, and all the rest. But if you don't fit into that neoliberal 
glorified niche of being great at STEM and good for business and good for your economy, we don't want to know. That's what it seems to be at the end of the day. And I, I completely agree with James McGrath about the problem with this. Um, so yeah, the cultural fetishising of high achieving white male, and it's usually white male as well, women again tend to not to get much of a hearing. That is changing, by the way, that is changing. But um, but what's it, what's even more, um, what, 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 what is it doesn't seem to be changing is that autistics who are not able to work, and there are many autistics who just can't work, um, just do not seem to get much representation. I mean, if you look at the National Autistic Society, for example, how often do you see people look on benefits who aren't in work getting their stories heard? It's nearly always really successful autistics, and I do think there's a problem there. It's not to say we shouldn't hear from really successful autistics, we should. We should, but we should hear from everyone, and there seems to be so many who are being excluded from the narrative. Um, I mean, you know, they are thankfully focusing now more on, um, you know, women, and they're focusing more on ethnic minorities and things like that, and they're trying to em em focus more on gay autistics and things like that, but there does seem to be a glaring omission of autistics who are the most disabled. Um, and I do think we have a long way to go in terms of, like, our representation of disability in society and how disabled people are often treated as though, like, non-entities, like, we don't exist. And I just think that's really wrong. Um, we have to take a whole other video. Yeah, the cultural fetishising, high achieving white male, uh, but this comes back again to University of Cambridge Autism Research Centre, reinforcing the values of capitalism and patriarchy in the diagnosis process, um, James McGrath says, and I'd agree with him. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stop now because um, there's, there's quite a bit more I want to talk about um, in, um, in this book. Um, a naming at autism because it is such a good book. As I say, it is quite expensive, so you might not be able to get hold of a copy. But do check out to see if your library has it, and it is a really good book. Um, um, but I'll carry on uh, reviewing it next week. So thank you for watching.